I'm talking today with Dr Greg Moore, who's the head of inflammatory bowel disease at Monash Health. Thanks for your time, Greg. Thanks very much. You've written a pretty detailed piece for next Monday's MJA on biosimilars and, and some of the issues for inflammatory bowel disease. Tell us a little bit about what biologic medic medications are. Well, biologic medications are very different from the traditional medications we've had where they were predominantly small molecules, things such as aspirin, like mm -hmm. very small number of chemicals and very easily uh, replicatable. Biologic medications are usually monoclonal antibodies right. generated in biological systems, so highly complex and highly specific and being incredibly effective for a lot of diseases, particularly inflammatory diseases, mm -hmm. cancer and so forth. So there's been a revolution in terms of how we can actually treat our diseases. So these days it's, it's more about actually treating damaged tissue rather than keeping symptoms in check really. Yeah, it's actually allowed us to sort of change our management paradigm to the point that we can actually achieve healing of the bowel and prevent that accumulated damage and minimise the need for corticosteroids and drugs like that with accumulated toxicity. So they've really changed the game for us. So they're complicated medications. Does that make them complicated and expensive to make? Very much so. Yeah. So um, it really requires culture systems, lots of processing, and we're talking costs of drugs in the tens of thousands per annum, yep, yep. Uh, so they're very expensive drugs, but the health economics of these drugs work out and they do achieve such benefits that they're very useful, but incredibly expensive. And as patients go on to these drugs and achieve response, they tend to stay on the drugs, so mm -hmm. it's an ever-increasing cost burden for our health budget. Are oh, they, they're PBS sponsored, yeah. Most indications are PBS. There are obviously conditions that fall through the cracks where there isn't mm -hmm. a clinical trial data, uh, but yes, PBS. And they make up a significant number of the sort of top 20 most expensive drugs that cost for PBS. So it makes sense that as these drugs come off patent, biosimilars are being made. Yeah. Um, obviously there are advantages to that because it's cheaper. And What are the worries about biosimilars? So probably just to define a biosimilar, because these molecules are so complex, it's almost impossible to make an exact duplicate copy. So they're not called generics. And I think that's important to note. So unlike, say, an antihypertensive medication mm -hmm. or something like that, or a, a, for instance a statin, you can't make an exact copy. Right. But these drugs are rigorously assessed and there's a global push to make sure that they are as close as possible, virtually identical, but they're not completely identical and it's very hard to actually make them identical. Because yeah. of the processes in making them, they're still not enormously cheaper, yeah. they are somewhat cheaper. And that's, given the volumes and the cost, it's still very important for us to have those cost savings. Okay, well, Australia makes, um, you know, if, if it's good for one indication of the originator, it's good for all of them. Yeah. Is that a good system? I think clinicians are sort of happy with that because these drugs have been um, assessed rigorously in a couple of conditions and they're, they're as close as we can. I think we don't have particular problems with what they call extrapolation of indication. Mm -hmm. So infliximab, which is the first biosimilar we're dealing with in the inflammatory sphere, has been demonstrated in randomised clinical control trials in a number of things like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis and so forth. Mm -hmm. It was only studied though the biosimilar in rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis and efficacy was found to be equivalent. And I think as clinicians we're happy with that because yep. the drug is made as close as possible to be similar, seems to work, and the initial data we have in the real world would support that it seems to be about the efficacy is equivalent. Safety? Safety is an interesting question and obviously we already have issues with the patients generating antibodies against biological medications. These are yeah. large foreign proteins. Um, it's been an issue and we have you know, a significant percentage of patients who will lose response and up to 50% of patients may need dose intensification or will get reactions and need to switch. Mm -hmm. So obviously when you have a new drug which is almost identical but not quite, there is theoretical concern that that may be more likely to generate antibodies. Right. There's been some studies now done showing that if you have antibodies to the originator compound, those antibodies cross-react against the biosimilar. Okay. And that's very reassuring for us to say that they look very, very similar even if your immune system can't tell the difference. Yes. There's been some studies done now looking at a single switch yes. where patients been on the originator drug, then put on the biosimilar, doesn't appear to be any particular problems in immunogenicity or loss of response. What we're concerned is multiple switching back and forth, yep. which has not been prospectively studied. And there's been no rigorous pharmacovigilance to look at that particular situation, which may arise due to some decisions in this country. To put that in practical terms, if a patient goes into a pharmacist and says, I need this, and they say, oh, we haven't got any of that, but we can give you this, mm -hmm. same stuff. Does that mean that patients are, in theory, getting a different prescription every time they 
potential. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's controlled as much as within limits, but it's a complex drug and we don't have that long-term safety data and we know these patients can use these drugs for a long time. Yeah, yeah. This is a different situation from some other biologics, say for instance colony stimulating factors, where it's probably only a short period of time a patient's going to be on that medication you know, for marrow support or so forth in chemotherapy. We're talking potentially decades patients are going to be on these drugs. And as a clinician, and from the patient representative bodies, that really is some concern that the that the safety, of the long term evidence of switching back and forth. Is yeah. There. But for the health economics are clearly there and support it. So, do we need a um, a vigilance program about multi switching and a flagging? Oh, we certainly do. I mean, the the current systems we have are not very dynamic. They're mm. often quite retrospective, um, voluntary reporting, for instance, to the TGA. Um, of adverse events. Of adverse yep. events, which uh, there's not very high rates of actually reporting. Busy clinicians are busy doing other things yep. rather than you know filling in more forms. So we don't have any real-time way of tracking patients switching at the time and having adverse events. There are ongoing discussions and the government has formed a working group on this, but currently we do not have that. Is it is it a, a something the pharmacists can help out with? Oh, certainly pharmacists can help in definitely that situation. Um, we're in a bit of an interesting situation with infliximab because it's very overwhelmingly hospital prescribed. Yeah. So it's quite a controlled situation, but the same approach, and um, there's a decision made called A flagging yes. that the government's made, which the health minister makes a, a determination that the pharmacist can substitute a medication at the point of dispensing yeah. without necessarily talking to the prescriber. And that's the point of contention, I think, with the peak bodies, yeah. that it's such a complex drug, such complex pharmacology, physiology, and immunology about this, that it's really a discussion that should be best had between the patient and the prescribing doctor. Right. Now, as a prescribing doctor, if I tick brand substitution not permitted, that takes that out of the equation. Yes. But if that hasn't been done, there will be an issue. With the newer self-administered biologics also reaching patent expiry and yep. biosimilars coming in, that's going to be much more of an issue with community pharmacies dispensing the vast majority of those medications. We're not looking to create fear, and I, sure. I think theoretically this is an unlikely event, but the absence of data to show that this is safe yep. is not enough yep. to go forth into the No unknown. data doesn't mean safe. No. So that's our concern. And look, I suspect as time goes by we'll get much more experience, particularly from Europe, where mm -hmm. there's a lot of medication going on, but most of the changes have been single switch, not switch back, switch back, switch back. So we as, as the patient sort of representatives and peak uh, medical groups sort of think that it's really about education of the prescriber yep. and also of the patient yes. to really take that into account. And as it stands, there is cost savings just from the introduction of a biosimilar. Mm -hmm. There's mandated cost savings, which is fantastic. Yep. Beyond that, the savings are actually not appreciable yeah. in the next few years. There yep. will be further savings as everyone's PBS reimbursement goes down as the competition's assessed in the market. But yeah. it's not just by introducing a flagging there's necessarily a cost saving. Just introducing a biosimilar actually achieves those cost savings. So we think it was an unnecessary step, yeah. but it's not something that's looking like it's going to be reversed. No. Hopefully you know, we'll have this discussion in five years' time and we'll be very reassured that it was never an issue in the first place. Thank you for your time. Pleasure.